I'm John Pendry. I'm a professor of physics at Imperial College London, and I work on uh, a new field called uh, metamaterials. Its present uh, existence came about in about 1999 when I, I wrote a paper for the Laguna Beach meeting and that seemed to spark a lot of interest in the field, though, though the time was ripe for a new approach to optical materials, I think. My particular interest actually arose out of industrial consultancy. I was working for the Marconi Company. Uh, they had uh, some material which they used for absorbing radar waves and it worked very well but they, they didn't have any theoretical understanding at that time of why this stuff worked so well. And so they asked me if I could uh, do some theory and explain to them why they had some good stuff. Um, and it turned out that this uh, radar absorbing material was in the form of uh, very thin carbon fibers. And the fact that it worked had to do not so much with the fact that it was made from carbon, but it had to do with the structure of the carbon made into thin fibers and that gave me the idea that uh, you could uh, change the properties of material not only by changing its chemistry but by changing its uh, internal uh, physical structure on a scale much less than the wavelength. And uh, that, that started off, me off into the field of metamaterials and uh, I think most of the papers date from uh, uh, started in 1999 when the field started to grow exponentially. The definition is very broad so there are many different types of metamaterials. The, the simplest structure you could have is if you wanted to reduce the dielectric constant of a piece of glass you could do so by drilling a lot of holes in it and making it less dense and that's the very simplest form of metamaterial, it, it uh, not surprisingly something so simple isn't uh, very useful because uh, there, are other, there are other ways of getting uh, low refractive index materials. Um, perhaps the most interesting ones are those in which the internal structure has some uh, interesting function like a, a, a res a res what we call a resonance. Um, for example, if, if you built uh, a very, very tiny structure made of uh, a tiny metal coil and uh, a tiny metal capacitor, that would form a resonant circuit. And if you then assembled hundreds of thousands of these together to make a, a, a solid three-dimensional mass, that would have some very remarkable properties. And that, that is a resonant metamaterial and they have been used to produce properties which are never found in nature, such as a negative refractive index, which has some very, very startling consequences. The beauty of the concept is that it's very broad. It doesn't just apply to materials which respond to light. You're uh, talking about materials which can control radar waves, a terahertz is another region of the spectrum in which people are getting very interested and where they're short of uh, materials with the right properties they need to do what they want. Uh, infrared is another area. Right across the electromagnetic spectrum there is potential for these materials to, to do, do great things. And outside that, uh, the very idea that a property could depend on structure it, it's not even confined to electromagnetism. People are talking about um, acoustic metamaterials which can steer sound around objects, uh, metamaterials which respond to ocean waves and maybe could uh, divert large and harmful waves away from the shore, shoreline uh, and, and so on. So, so the, the concept has really taken root in, in a lot of people's minds. I think the reason for that is it's very simplicity. You, you, you know, you think, yes, structure, of course. Why didn't we think of that? I introduced this concept of cloaking as a joke. And, and the, the reason we did it was that we, we have these uh, powerful sets of materials, which metamaterials enable us to create. And we also have a design technique called transformation optics, which uh, uh, tells us how to shape the metamaterial to do the job we, we want to do and we wanted to show people how powerful this was and so in, in a, a meeting in about 2003 or 4 in San Antonio which DARPA organized they said please could you tell us about these ideas and let's see it spiced up a little so 
I thought, what's the most extreme thing you could do with this new technology? I know we could hide something and that'll smack it to him really good. So I expected lots of laughs when I <laughs> said, hey, here's a cloak and here's how you can make one. And everybody was very serious, <laughs> hey, you can make a cloak. So um, my, uh, my taking on the cloak is it's, it's something I worked on because I wanted to show the most extreme thing you can do. I think that the, the first applications of metamaterials will be to do really simple things, uh, but do them better and cheaper than we can already. And then we'll work up to the more complex things. I think it's pretty sure that any cloak that Harry Potter would recognize is, is not uh, on the table. Uh, that, that is, is uh, so you, you could dream up some theory, but the very practicality of making it will be so impossible. But can you hide things uh, from light? Yes. Can you hide things which are a few centimeters across? Yes. Is the cloak really uh, flexible and flappy? No. Will it ever be? No. So uh, you can do quite a lot of things, but there, there, there are limitations. And I, I think uh, there are going to be a lot of disappointed kids around, but there might be a few people in industry who are very grateful for it.